Introduction, Seaman First Class. How did I end up with this information on the USS Astrobula? It was the night before settlement on our father's home, the home we grew up in. My brother Richard, his wife Kay, their son JJ, my sisters Kathy and Mary Lynn, and the rest of the family had been emptying the house for two months. Two dumpsters later, the house was finally empty, except the downstairs closet. I remember sitting on the floor with my husband Rob, my brother Richie, and his wife Kay, dividing up the final boxes of the house. I got the projector, old films, and a box of mystery stuff. When I got home, I started pulling napkins out of the box that had names of the bride and groom and wedding date on the napkins. During wedding receptions, Dad would stick them in his suit pocket where a handkerchief would be. He was a sentimental kind of guy. To think that this box almost got thrown away amazes me. At the bottom of the box was this blue bound logbook on the USS Astribula. I looked at the pictures and stored it in our bookcase. Months and years later, in 2012, I read each page in the book and was frozen when I read about how many times the Japanese airplane shot at the USS Astribula. They were in the largest battle of World War II and my father never talked about it, the Battle of Leyte Gulf. The Japanese attacked them at 8.30 a.m., then again at 11.10, 12.15, 17.06, 18.30, 1846, they were hit at 1848. The ship had a 13 degree list to port. As I read this, I just imagined my dad going through this and I was overwhelmed. I remember the Pearl Harbor movie. I remember how the planes came over and how they were hit. In that moment, I could feel or experience what it was like to be constantly bombarded with shots in such short intervals. I wish I would have asked questions when he was alive although I didn't, didn't know what questions to ask. That started my research, my investigation. My husband and I went to libraries and got every book and video I could get on the Lake de Golf battle. Later, we went to the National Archives in Maryland. This book is dedicated to my father, John R. Condash, and all the men that served on the USS Astrobula from the day it was commissioned to its unsinkable fate in the ocean. Seaman First Class is a collection of writings by the sailors on the USS Astrobula during World War II, taken from their two-year anniversary logbook written after the war. Stories from sailors after the war and documentation from the National Archives in Maryland. There are also photos from John R. Condash that he had taken during the war and photos from the anniversary book. Unlike other World War II books that are more about Germany and land combat, Seaman First Class focuses on the battles at sea against the Japanese naval fleet. Unlike Victory X C, these are stories about the ordinary sailors being heroes at sea instead of admirals making high level decisions and mistakes on the sea. All reprints of W. W2, World War II, veteran comments are unedited. Many of the sailors did not have a high school degree. My husband and I went to the National Archives in Maryland and saw original documents of the daily logs. I took the stories in the blue log book and put them in chronological order through this book. Whenever you hear that the material is BLB, which means blue log book, those quotes and those paragraphs come directly from the blue log book. You will notice that the blue log book has only four stars on it, Marshall, Saipan, Okinawa, and Japan. When I did the research, they said they received eight stars from World War II. If you notice, there is not a star for Lady Golf. And when I read some of the sailors' writings in the Blue Log Book, they complained about not getting a star for Lady Golf. If you do any research on your own, you will find very little of USS Astrobula from World War II that is digital. There is more information from Vietnam on. Unfortunately, at the time of this recording, I do not know what battles the other three stars represent. I have taken the liberty of writing accounts in the first person. The story starts here. My brother and I were talking about getting into the same boot camp and how we would protect each other. We knew it was just a dream, but it was a good dream. We both respected each other. 
George was five years older than me. Just as we were talking about being in the same boot camp, someone in charge was shouting, one, two, three. When he got to us, George was one and I was two. We said, what are they doing? The person in charge said, all ones, you are in the army. Twos, you are in the Navy. And that's how I ended up in the Navy. We were reading the local news in the Bethlehem Globe Times for a while, and they said, made it sound like the war was almost over. On December 6, 1941, in the Globe Times, Kingsbury Smith wrote about the four factors making the Japanese more conciliatory. And then Pearl Harbor happened, and we are smack dab in the middle of World War II. I turned 18 on April 24, 1941. I was born in 1924 in a small town of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. We were poor, but we had food. My father, John P. Kundash, came over from Czechoslovakia and went to a Slovak church called St. Cyril's Amethodias on the south side of Bethlehem. I only made it to the eighth grade. I had to help pay the bills. My mother died from complications of a car accident when I was three. My older sisters, especially Anna and Mary, raised me. We're all dressed up, my buddy Mello and me, and ready to go on a date. The New York Giants football game is on the radio. Ladies and gentlemen, the man on the radio says, we interrupt this radio program. Pearl Harbor has just been attacked. We turn to each other and I say to Mello, where is Pearl Harbor? And then he said, I don't know who attacked us. We went on our dates, but there was something missing. By the time we got to the corner, we met a neighbor. He said, Pearl Harbor's in the Hawaiian Islands. And right away, we knew it had to be the Japanese. We were at war. Men from the Pennsylvania Reserve Defense Corps and Allentown Companies F are already standing guard at the armory and at two bridges crossing the Delaware River at Easton in case of wartime attack. The Lehigh County Council of Defense, organized to prepare Lehigh County and Allentown in case of attack, announces that blackouts are in effect. Everyone must draw their shades at night so no lights can be seen. Deputy air raid wardens are told to be on standby at all times. Aircraft spotters, volunteers who scan the sky for enemy warplanes, are on the lookout. Meanwhile, volunteers rush to their local post offices to join the Army, Navy, and Marines. The American Red Cross begins to enroll women in the 10 the Nur Volunteer Nurses Aid Corps to serve as volunteer nurses aides and to assist in nurses in hospitals, per the Bethlehem Globe Times. 1940, United States imposes the draft. On this day in 1940, the Burke-Wadsworth Act is passed by Congress by wide margins in both houses and the first peacetime draft in the history of the United States is imposed. Selective service was born. The registration of men between the ages of 21 and 36 began exactly one month later. As Secretary of War, Henry L. Stimson, who had been a key player in moving the Roosevelt administration away from a foreign policy of strict neutrality, began drawing draft numbers out of a glass bowl. The numbers were handed to the president who read them out loud for public announcement. There were some 20 million eligible young men. 50% were rejected the very first year, either for health reasons or illiteracy. 20% of those who registered were, were illiterate. In November 1942, with the United States now a participant in the war and not merely a neutral bystander, the draft ages expanded. Men 18 to 37 were now eligible. Blacks were passed over for the draft because of the racist assumptions about their abilities and the viability of a mixed race military. But this changed in 1943 when a quota was imposed, meant to limit the number of blacks drafted to reflect their numbers in the overall population, roughly 10.6% of the whole. Initially, blacks were restricted to labor units, but this too ended as the war progressed, when they were finally used in combat. Conscientious objector status was granted to those who could demonstrate sincerity of belief in religious teachings combined with a profound moral aversion to war. Quakers made up most of the COs, but 75% of those Quakers who were drafted fought, 
COs had to perform alternate service in civilian public service camps, which entailed long hours of hazardous work for no compensation. About 5,000 to 6,000 men were in prison for failing to register or serve the nation in any form. These numbers were comprised mostly of Jehovah Witnesses. By the end of the war, approximately 34 million men had registered and 10 million served with the military. Watching the trees go by out of the window of the train, I remember what my sister said when I was leaving. Anna's saying, you can't kill a chicken. How are you going to kill a jack? My sister Elizabeth says, don't get drunk and wake up with a tattoo. My sister Mary says, have fun. You can have fun anywhere. Think of all the exotic places you're going to see. Just by their goodbyes, you could tell the personalities of each sister. I remember the chicken running around with his head cut off. Then another passenger interrupts my thoughts and says, Hi, my name is Specky. I'm from Bethlehem, PA. What's your name? I think I saw you in line the other day, signing up. Samson, New York, Naval Training Camp during World War II. I learned a lot these weeks in boot camp. We learned how to make naval rope knots, put out fires, shoot gunners, march in unison, and read maps. Even though Great Lakes, Illinois is the official training camp for the Navy, the Navy established another training camp in Sampson, New York during the war. Induction at the training facility was a two-step process. For the first three weeks, inductees were kept in detention facilities to ensure that communicable diseases were confined. This was a full training facility limited to the first three weeks. Inductees were then transferred to the main camp for the remainder of the training. Inductees were vaccinated and carefully screened for medical and dental issues. They were tested and evaluated for mechanical competence, mathematical skills, English and spelling. They were also tested for hearing, including pitch and rhythm. Their scores were noted and they sorted the trainees into their naval assignments. The daily life of the naval trainee tried to approximate ship life. Each separate barracks were treated like an individual ship. At 5.45 a.m., everyone awoke, had 15 minutes to stow and clean their bed area, exercise for 15 minutes, shower and then clean stations have a mustard formation and eat breakfast. After breakfast, they would be marching and three sets of drills. Then remove bedding, which was airing out, prepare your mess kit and noon was dinner. After 55 minutes, drill call followed by afternoon of March, assembly, drill, repeat. At 1630, retreat from athletic activities. On Liberty Days, there was a 45 minute liberty from 1645 to 1715. Then you assemble your mess gear and march to supper. Religious services on Sunday were mandatory at Samson. Every sailor must attend. Guests were permissible at Samson, but only on Sunday between 1300 and 1630. The only permissible guests were father, mother, wife, or siblings. No girlfriends or other friends. This is a photo of John R. Condash's boot camp, Company 433, Sampson, New York. My father said he remembers getting shots before this picture was taken and that they were itchy in the new uniform. This is a photo at Great Lakes Naval Base in Illinois with his sister Helen and her husband, Steve. I am not sure what date this photo was taken. There she is, the grand old lady, USS Astabula. Fleet oiler AO-51 was laid down on October 1st, 1942 as Maritime Commission Hall Number 717, Bethlehem Sparrows Point Shipyard, made with Bethlehem Steel. Since our family and some of the crew members were from Bethlehem, PA, we are very proud it was made in our hometown. USS Astrobula is the first ship of the fleet to be named in the honor of the Astrobula River in the state of Ohio. Astrobula is an Indian word meaning fish river. She was launched May 23, 1943 
under the sponsorship of Mrs. Adolph Burrell, wife of the Assistant Secretary of State. The Ashtabula was commissioned on August 7, 1943, under the command of Commander Louis J. Mode at USNR. Specifications of the ship. Displacement, 7,470 tons. Length, 553. Beam, 75. Draft, 32 feet, 4 inches. Speed, 18.3 knots. Complement, 20 officers, 278 enlisted. Largest boom capacity, 10 tons. Cargo capacity, Navy Standard Fuel Oil, 123,700 BBLS. Gasoline, 788,000 BBLS. Armament, one single five inch slash 38 dual purpose gun mount, four single three inch slash 50 dual purpose gun mounts, four twin 40 millimeter AA gun mounts, eight single 20 millimeter AA gun mounts, fuel oil capacity 15,000 BBLS. Propulsion, two Bethlehem turbines, four Foster Wheeler boilers, K-type boilers, double Falk main reduction gears. The ship was later jumbo sized, but we're not gonna talk about that right now. That's the initial specifications of the ship. Sailors are loading the ship with everything the ship needs. It is its maiden voyage and the ship needs everything. The first sailors are called plank owners. I guess they get that name for how many times they have to walk the plank into and out of the ship to load it with supplies. I had been loading the ship all morning and decided to take a break in a quiet room I found to lay down a few minutes. I'm not a lazy guy, but I was really tired. My, wet, my rest was interrupted by Captain Moday, the captain of the ship. He said, are you in charge of this department? I said, yes, sir. I didn't know what I was saying yes to, but I was told to always say yes, sir, to the captain. Later, I found out it was the laundry department on the ship. And he said, it is one of the luckiest things that could have happened the first day on the ship. Astribula travel log book starting in 1943. Page one, travel log book, page two. This is the first story from the blue log book, J.E. Weems Ensign. Chief Boatswain's mate Keith, an old timer with about 30 years Navy service, stepped to the speaker piped attention and in weather beaten voice crackled, set the watch, section one has the duty. Those present that day, 8743, will remember that Boats had a few bandages visible on no, his nose and face. He could still pitch a sailor's liberty. Ensign Brown had the deck that sunny afternoon at Sparrows Point, Maryland. The quartermaster was H.A. White, another veteran. On the first page of the first quartermaster's notebook, you'll see 1430 USS Ashtabula, A-S-H-T-U-B-L-A, -A, put in commission, Lieutenant Commander Moday, USNR, Commanding Officer, Lieutenant J.M. Crandall, officiating. Pappy White couldn't spell the name of the ship correctly on August 7, 1943, but they put her in commission anyway, and for the next two years and eight days of the war, the USS Astabula, A-S-H-T-A-B-U-L-A, AO 51 did her job quietly without the benefit of publicity the glamorous fighting ship Scott. The next day we moved to Point Port Covington Yard, Maryland. On August 10th we left for Norfolk. Nine days later we began our shakedown cruise in Chesapeake Bay. From Norfolk we went to Aruba in the Netherlands West Indies, thence through the Panama Canal to visit Balboa. Going through the Panama Canal will long linger in the memories of those on board. It was on the afternoon of September 20th that we entered Ganta and Locks. The gates closed and the lock flooded. When we got underway through the canal in a heavy rainstorm in which visibility dropped to zero. A little after 1800, we entered 
Pedro Miguel locks one hour later, Mira Flores locks, and at 2035 entered Balboa Harbor. That night, we were moored to birth 15 Balboa, Panama, site of some legendary liberties. USS Astrobula transporting soldiers and PT cruisers before being fitted as an oil tanker. J.E. Weems writes, from Balboa, we went to Pongo Pongo, Tonga, Tabu, and Espiritu Santo before returning to San Pedro. On the first trip out, an important part of the cargo was PT boats delivered with the crews. In those days, the Astribula was not called on to fuel at sea. She was made a fleet oiler early in 1944 on her second trip. This is a rare photo from John R. Kundash. When we first saw the photo, we were wondering why there were not any fueling tools on the ship. Now we know why. This is from the Blue Logbook. One man's life is lost. We were in the States for Christmas dinner in Leeds. During the month, we were in San Pedro. We suffered our only fatality of the war. Story of Seaman First Class was killed on the morning of December 8, 1943, while trying to lower himself over the side. He fell and was crushed between the ship and camel. This is a photo of Alfred Leinbrecht. I was fortunate enough to meet him at one of the USS Astrobula reunions. His son and him wrote this next piece of how he arrived on the USS Astrobula. I had orders to report for duty with a minesweeper in San Pedro, and I was walking down the dock. I saw that first, it was an old wooden ship, and secondly, it had been all shot up from a previous incursion and no way in hell I wanted to be aboard that thing. So instead of actually reporting on board, I decided to go fishing for a couple of hours. When I returned, the ship had already left dock, and I knew then I was going to be in big trouble, but I didn't care because I felt that I had dodged a big bullet. I went back to the assignment office to take, officer to take my medicine. The officer was so mad, cursing at me and saying things like, you SOB, who in the hell do you think you are? You're in the U.S. Navy now, and you're getting on the next blank, blank, blank damn ship out of here. Which, as fate would have it, was the USS Astrobula. Before heading out to the Yellow Sea, the Astrobula made a stop at Pearl Harbor, which shortly before had crossed the equator. The new guys who had never crossed got their heads shaved bald and had to eat a large spoon of kitchen grease. I didn't mind the head shaving since I was pretty fresh out of the boot camp at Great Lakes Naval Training Center. But the grease was tough to swallow and a couple of guys threw up right away. I was also the ship's librarian and there were times when they were refueling another ship and they would string a zip line to the other ship while underway, side by side, and strap me to a chair holding a sea bag full of books to trade. The sea was choppy and I would bob up and down like a yo-yo, clutching the bag, holding on for dear life because if I fell, they weren't about to stop and chances were slim that I would be rescued. When asked why they just didn't send the bag over, the books were good as gold aboard ship and you just didn't take a bunch of books unseen. Besides that, I always went to the captain after the trade to give him first pick, which got me on the captain's good side. I was also a radio man on the communications crew, which required me to work below the waterline and I was claustrophobic as well. While they were in Okinawa and a high value target of the kamikazes, I would hear and feel the six cannons go off, first rocking the ship, then came the four inch, then the 50, 50 millimeter guns. And then by the time you heard the 20 millimeter firing, you were crapping in your pants. I hated working below waterline so much saying, I didn't want to drown like a rat, I wanted to go down fighting. I managed to trade assignments with another shipmate who hated being exposed during the attacks and ended up topside lo loading the 20 millimeter guns with ammunition coming up from the breach while the gunner was firing away. When asked if this wasn't more dangerous than working below deck, I replied, hell yes, but at least I felt we had a fighting chance. I still carry a small scar on my left 
shoulder from my time on the 20 millimeter. Life on the Ship, the Blue Log Book. Speaking of him, Lieutenant J.G. Klingeman, there's another story. You'll remember the only difference between our general quarters alarms and quarters for muster roll call signal is that JQ is a constant, while for quarters, four buzzes are sounded. On two different occasions, Mr. Klingerman was up in battle dress and by his gun before he discovered we were only having quarters for muster. For instance, remember the seaman who stood watch in the foremast? His GQ station was in the mainmast. Every time GQ sounded on his watch, he'd have to half slide down the foremast, fly across the catwalks, and scamper up the mainmast. By that time, secure from GQ was usually sounded. Commentary. As I said, this ship was huge, and the only time you got to see your buddies was when you had chow or planned to meet someone on the ship. Specky, who I met on the train, was working at the other end of the ship. So when we wanted to talk to each other, we had to send handwritten notes to date, time, and place to meet. Of course, there wasn't much to do on the ship when you weren't doing your assigned task, so some guys would like to pull practical jokes on the new guys. Blue book, log book. Instructions were given to the messenger who was sent to find Mr. Peterson. First, look on the cargo deck. If he's not there, try the forecastle, well decks, or fantail. Maybe he's in the ship's office. If not, go down the chain locker. If not successful there, look up at the foremast. Steering engine room, boss locker, forward hold, bridge 40 foot motor launch, and all diesel and black fuel oil tanks. If you look there and still can't find him, try his room. He might be there. Wasn't it Metzger who was messenger on one watch and somehow fell over the side while standing on the quarter deck? Commentary. After sunset, we would either talk or think. I often wondered how my brother was doing and which one of which one of had the sa which one of us had the safest job that would get us home alive and in one piece. Our ship wasn't normally in the action, although we were surrounded by the action. Everyone told us if the ship gets hit, we were a goner. For us it was either alive or dead. There didn't seem to be an in between. Combat on land, you were constantly in battle and your chances of stepping on a mine and being maimed was higher or being hit with scrap metal. Commanding officer. Okay, men, as you learned in boot camp, when you are at seas, you do not sail in a straight line like you are sailing the coast of California. No, you zigzag to make sure you are not going to get hit by a torpedo. This is an oil tanker and I don't feel like getting blown up. From the Blue Logbook. On the Astrobula, night watches are hard on anyone, but it seems they took their toll, especially on Mr. Fellinward, commanding officer. Never quite fully awake on any watch between sunset and sunrise. Alpha is said to have dozed and fallen off a tool in the wheelhouse. On another occasion, Packhorse, our code name, was last in a column of a convoy which was zigzagging. Alpha was keeping the zigzag plan, and unfortunately, it was at night. About halfway through the watch, Alpha dozed off, not noticed by others on the bridge, forgetting worries of the world, and also the zigzag plan. Ten minutes later, the ship, which was formerly ahead of us, came up on the TBS, talk between ships. We seem to have lost pack horse, and told the OTC, officer and tactical command, Lieutenant J.G. Kligman had his own way of keeping the zigzag plan. If he happened not to zig when he should have, he'd just make the zag that much earlier. Our main duty was to fill other ships with fuel, but we were often referred to as the floating general store for the U.S. Navy. We exchanged books and movies by using a cable and basket to pass items from ship to ship. In fact, our ships today are called replenishment oiler. Let's first talk about how we fueled other ships. Yes, 
They were all dependent on us, but we never got much credit. We could fuel two ships at one time, and we fueled them all, from destroyer to aircraft. We have to maintain the same speed to fill the ships. Huge hoses were connected to the ship and fuel was transferred. If you can imagine driving parallel with someone on the highway at 65 miles per hour, you are in the center lane, you are a water tank truck, you have a mini Cooper on one side and a huge RV on the other side. You throw each one a hose and you hook up both of them, never stopping. Now turn on the water until both are filled. As you can see, this was not an easy task. The Blue Log Book. Our old chief ship fitter had a quaint revenge for any ship that gave him a bad time during a fueling operation. After they had fueled to capacity, we had stopped pumping and they had disconnected the hose to give it back to us. He would open the valve, a wonderful spurt of thick black oil would go all over their beautifully clean decks. The enlisted men had jail bunk rooms. When there were six or more guys in a room, you get used to it. When one person snored, the whole bunk vibrated. We used to take stinky socks and put them on the snoring person's nose so they would wake up and stop snoring. The boys in the radio shack will remember Steckel, the happy investor, who was trying hard to figure a way to have Fox sched schedules copied automatically. He wasn't lazy, he just believed in sleep. Then there's Cooper with the politician's draw who couldn't talk enough when he was awake, so he talked in his sleep too. And speaking of sleep, it seemed that Big Mac Clary was blessed with the ability of sleeping anywhere, and he did most of the time. Commentary. Gambling was a pastime on the ship, but I didn't have enough money to lose. I had to send it back home to the family. Most of the guys in the ship knew I didn't drink, so they trusted me with their money. I would get a cut for holding the money and dividing it out. You can either call me a trusted sailor or a ship bookie. This is from a section of the blue log book entitled Remember When. So there, this is a collection of comments and memories from sailors on the ship. And, um, we're going to start here. There are names. I do not always pronounce them correctly, so I will sometimes give you the spelling. John says, each sailor would get an allotment of cigarettes, but I didn't smoke. So this was another way for me to make money. The smokers always needed more smokes. Blue log book. Crossing the equator is always fun for shellbacks. Remember when we crossed Ensign Pollywog Carey, gunner officer, had been having the gunner's mates carry more than a few ammo cases. So in the initiation, guess who was carrying them? The gunner mates being shellbacks. John, it was an honor to cross the equator, something that I will never forget. Not too many people have had the honor to do it. And here I am, a boy from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, crossing the equator. You get a certificate that you crossed it and you get the name as a shellback. We crossed the equator so many times in the Pacific doing our zigzag plan. Blue log book. Fire controlman Freeman will deny this story, but those on the signal bridge at the time will swear to the truth of it. Freeman had just come aboard and he was given lookout watch in the main mast. On his first time to relieve the watch, he went up to the foremast. You don't relieve me, you relieve the main mast, he was told by that lookout. Climbing down, he walked aft and then up the signal bridge and with a deadpan expression, pass Dugway, D-U-G-U-A-Y, for sure, F-R-A-S-U-R-E, Clausen, and Fundarnish, F-U-N-D-A-R-N-I-S-H, who were having a session. As if he owned the place, he started up the radar mast. In open mouth astonishment, the four men watched him until he was about halfway up. Then Dugue called up, where do you think you're going? I'm going to relieve the lookout, of course. Remember the time a certain electrician sent an MMD slash C after some nickel plated, copper coated short circuit wire? You wouldn't know anything about that, would you, Pruitt? 
and the time machinist Willet went up to the crow's nest looking for eggs. How about the time Professor Palanini, P-A-O-L-I-N-I, absentmindedly walked out of the mess hall to the compartment with his empty chow tray in his hand? The boys in the engine room say that Ralph Nelson is so short he has to take three or four steps before he moves, and that Division A office Sperling can figure everything on his slide roll except how to get out of the Navy. Engineers will remember Linton, who knows everything there is to know about everything in general. Question, how many men on the football team? Answer, nine. Pat Tonelli and his 40-year contract to build a milling machine attachment and his index head. Willitson, W-I-L-L-A-D-S-O-N, the grease gun cowboy. What does the evac room mean? To elections, uh, electricians, USO, to engine room, better coffee, or something to look up to, to engineer officer, headache, to its company, paradise, to Madden, laundry, to steel man, sleeping quarters, to machine shop, reserve tool chest, to mess cooks, largest food consumer, to all the ship, water. Kruger still thinks he can control the horsepower of the main engine with his spurs, and will never forget Mr. Hazlitt, who shaved his mustache off every other day, so you could never tell how he'd look the next day. There I am in the bottom right-hand corner, John Kundash. Let me tell you the story about our very own ham. The men taking the food to the kitchen walked right by the laundry room. One day, one of my buddies was taking food to the kitchen and I was standing by the doorway. He said, Johnny, catch. He threw a ham to me and we cooked the ham from the steam from the washer and dryers. These little escapades help keep the doldrums away at sea. You had to put your name on everything. Someone would take either accidentally or on purpose. It's the only way you were going to get your laundry back. I put my name on everything. I would carve it, engrave it, ink it, whatever would work. I even engraved my roller skates. And I continued to do it after I left the Navy. The Navy kept us busy during the day, but the night you had to find something to occupy your time. Sometimes we could have movies, some people read books. I had a harmonica and my buddy had an accordion and we would play songs and sing songs to pass time. We would make up plays and take turns playing the female parts, just like the Shakespearean plays. Photos of the acting troupe board the USS Astabula. As you can see, this is a photo of the officers that were in the blue log book. I apologize that the uh, photo is not clearer, but hopefully you can um, see their names. On our second trip out, we left San Pedro bound for Pearl Harbor. The Astrobula's first operational start was in the Marshall's invasion in February, 1944. Although we did not fire a shot in combat there, we saw some action, especially in the early morning of February 12, 1944. We were anchored in Kwajalein Lagoon when at 2.10 a battle wagon commenced sounding signals on their whistle. At 2.16, all hands went to battle stations and the engine room made ready to get underway. 20 minutes later, we heard gunfire off the port bow and the first bomb dropped on ROI Island. Japanese planes had hit an ammunition dump. The planes never came within range of our guns. About a half an hour later, all action ceased, but in the morning, the ammo dump was still ablaze. Example of deck log, June 10, 1944, ROI Island, Marshall Islands, Saipan Star. I have 
put a link in for an article which um, explains more about the Saipan um, battle. There is not much in the blue logbook. This is it. After the Marshall's campaign, we took part in the Saipan operations in June, where we saw much fueling but little action. We were ordered back to the States and everyone was only too happy to comply. On August 29, 1944, we went out on our third and most eventful trip, stopping at Pearl Harbor, Anahuitoc, Guadalcanal, and Purvis Bay. We dropped anchor in Humboldt Bay, where we were when MacArthur was ready to return to the Philippines. We were flagship of the service force in this operation. Captain Beard and his staff came aboard October 11th while we were in Humboldt Bay. On the next day, we left. Photos and stories. On the next few slides while I read Getting Ready for Leyte Golf Battle from the Blue Logbook, I will show photos of the crew of the USS Astrobula. Action at Leyte. It's by Valcar RM2-C. I could not find a photo of him. Like I said, I will be showing uh, photos of the men on the ship. He writes, the big cruiser proudly steams into port, back from the wars, a bit scarred, slightly worked, yet proud, proud as a mast high. In the Navy yard, she takes her berth, and the hundreds of yard workers swarm to the dock, eager to get a glance at the 10,000 ton mass of fighting seal. All are proud of this cruiser. They should be. She is worthy of all her praise. On the same day, approximately at the same time, a gray tanker. Her great hull, a bit tarnished, slips into the yard unnoticed, takes her berth not far from the cruiser. No one comes to eye her. No remarks are passed on her. She's a ship with no glory. But wait, let's ride along with this tanker on her last trip. Let's see what she's been doing in the war. This ship with no glory. Action was soon to start in the Philippines. MacArthur was anxious to return to that stretch of land so many Americans died gloriously to defend. The fleet had been maneuvering for weeks to get into position to strike. Standing by in New Guinea was a tanker force overflowing with precious cargo waiting for orders. They came. At dusk under a lazy silvery moon, the tankers moved from their mooring. Fuel holes and lines in readiness, set to quench the thirst of wanting ships at sea. At dawn of the first day, a large force of small craft was sighted, mostly minesweepers. They dashed madly for the tankers and two at a time came alongside for drinks. Shortly before dusk, the last of the small craft had been taken care of and the tankers headed for a new rendezvous to fuel another force. A morning moon faded in the deep red of the tropical sky, and a few weak stars clung dimly to the dusty dawn. A huge force of transports and cargo ships huddled safely inside and on, out of line of the destroyers, cruisers and carriers cut the waves in swift approach to the welcomed tankers. Though tired and worn from the previous day's work, the tanker crews stood by their stations ready to take on any or all. The sea was rough and the ships rolled and pitched through the huge waves. A 35 knot gale blew furiously carrying sheets of blinding rain that stung the face. The drenched tanker crew never faltered and when the last ship had had its fill, the men wiped their brows, then smiled they knew it was a job well done. With empty tanks on the oilers, made their way to a small island still occupied by Japanese, but for weeks it had been isolated by the Americans and was being used as an anchorage for allied ships. Here the merchant tankers replenished our fleet oilers. At night, a motor launch patrolled around the ship. In it were two men besides the crew. One man to power his searchlight, another a Thompson submachine gun, but no Jap made any attempt to come aboard or get close enough to toss a grenade. The 
The sun was shining that morning when the tankers weighted anchor as once more made their way to the open sea for that all-important job of fueling, Uncle Sam's fighting ships. The day and time for a rendezvous had been set. It was an important operation, and early on the following morning, the tankers arrived on schedule, but no fleet could be seen. Orders were received to proceed to Leyte in the central Philippines, where just the day before, MacArthur had successfully made his initial landing. Throughout the day and night, the tankers streamed hurriedly toward their destination, and at dawn, the seemingly peaceful hills of Leyte were sighted. Not far offshore, the minesweepers were busy cleaning a safe channel. In the blue sky, not a plane, friendly or otherwise, could be seen. Following the gray tanker, the ships moved in column up Sarego Strait. In Leyte Gulf, the fleet nestled surrounded on three sides by land. A line of destroyers could be seen shelling the beach, knocking out enemy gun emplacements and splattering Jap blockhouses. Throughout the day, the tankers were kept moderately busy fueling the few destroyers that came alongside. Late in the afternoon, without warning, orders were received. All ships get underway. An enemy attack was on the way. It came first GQ, then the attack. All men were at battle stations on the gray tanker. From the blue sky, out of the setting sun, came the tiny black dots. Jap planes, like huge hornets, were closing in to sting the American ships. Zigzagging madly, but in perfect formation, our ships laid down a smokescreen that finally blacked out the last rays of sunset. Cruisers and destroyers were first to open fire on the enemy planes that were thick as flies. A few broke through and commenced an attack on the tankers and ammunition ships. The fleet oilers opened fire and put up a terrific barrage that drove off the intruders. The gray tanker for the first time had fired her guns at the enemy. It was her first taste of real war. Throughout the night, men on the gray tanker stood a lookout watch. How alarmingly quiet it was until the sun rose from behind sleepy waters. With dawn came another attacker by the nips, bombers, fighters, and torpedo planes all sparred for a punch. But again, the barrage was too great and the planes were driven off after causing slight damage. The tanker's guns were even given credit for three down jabs. During the day, the oilers fueled the few ships they could manage. Once again, as shadows crept across the bay, the ships moved cautiously about. The first of the attackers appeared. Again, the peace and the solitude of the late afternoon were disturbed by the roar of guns and explosion of bombs. The cruisers and destroyers on the horizon poured forth a continuous line of fire. Nip planes plummeted to their doom. A few broke through the cruiser destroyer defense, but quickly met their fate as the tanker spit a wicked barrage. A lucky few zoomed away. Quiet reigned once more. An all-night watch was set. The rest of the crew of the gray tanker tried for a little rest, but the crafty Japs weren't through yet. With anger and vengeance, they were working overtime on this night. Two fighters roared from their hiding place in the clouds and with guns blazing, concentrated their attack on our gray tanker. The low, weird, broken growl of the general quarters buzzers sounded. It caught the men off guard. Some were in chow lines. Meals were few and far between. Others in their sacks. A mad dash for the guns followed to escape the wild spray of bullets. Some took shelter, then scrambled to their guns. From the blackness of the mountain terrain, the dark forms of two torpedo bombers swooping low over the water closed in swiftly on the still unmanned form of the gray tanker. On October 23rd, we arrived in Leyte Gulf. On the next day, there were five Jap air attacks. 
at 820, 1110, 1214, 1706, and 1846. The last attack singled us as flagship out and one torpedo bomber coming in from our port side scored a hit at 1848. Moments later, a terrible crash amidships on the port side told of our torpedo hit there. The fish had ripped a savage hole in the hull of our ship, our home. In a flash came memories of days gone by. How sleek and handsome we thought our fair vessel that first day back in Baltimore. How she brought us to the life and color of Panama, the scenic beauty of Samoa, the gay happy days at Tonga, the Marshall's campaign, the Saipan invasion. We fell in love with our ship. Then as she lay helpless with a 13 degree list to port. How utterly proud of her we felt then. As Davy Jones reached out his waterlogged hand to claim her, she gallantly clung to the surface and soon was on even keel, ready to fight again. When the torpedo hit at Leyte, it knocked out the TBS, talk between ships. The radar men, Taylor, Gilbridge, Rogers, Weinstein, et al., immediately began setting up a TBY, portable radio service, emergency TBS for the emergency. Taylor was out on the blackened out after bridge deck when he shouted, I've lost part of the antenna. Soon Captain Beard and his staff, the skipper and exec were all on their hands and knees looking for it. Up on the protected signal bridge, Carvel, the big 6'2 Texan, tried desperately to crawl inside a 24 inch searchlight when he was straight strafing the delivery of automatic weapons by aircraft on ground target planes came over. One of the gunner's mates was sighting down the barrel of a 40 millimeter as if it were a shotgun and he on a duck hunt. One of the forward guns accidentally fired one round into the sky during a lull. Immediately, guns from all surrounding ships opened up at the point where the shell burst to make matters worse one of the ammo ships commenced firing low across our bow. They must have discovered that was the source of the disturbance. William Walter said, I was an MMFC serving much of my time in the Southwest Pacific. I was on board AO-51 when it was struck portside by a Japanese aerial torpedo. I still remember seeing him fly by and the cascade of seawater that followed the hit. We are now back to Valcora's account. And fight she did. The sky was now ablaze. Her crew came to life and with angry hearts they opened fire. The deafening roar of anti-aircraft shook the steel deck on which we stood. The enemy had injured our ship the crew fought in wild frenzy. The big gray tanker's firepower was astonishingly great. It was like a cruiser, was the comment of a nearby tanker. Another torpedo was launched at us. The nip who let that one go missed for the last time as he was blasted to a watery grave. The men fought gallantly. They were a rough and experienced crew by now. The Japs sensed this, and as those lucky enough disappeared as swiftly as they had come, the worn, sleepless crew were scheduled to another all-night watch. No sooner had the enemy planes been dispersed with that word would receive that a sizable Japanese task force was heading for Leyte, desperate to recapture the harbor. The Jap ships had already started up Sarego Strait and were some 15 miles away when our fleet met them. The night was like day. Flames soared in the sky. The burst of bombs and shells were deafening. The tankers awaited the outcome. Their very lives depended on our fighting ships. As the first rays of light streaked across the morning sky, the Jap planes come again. They seemed to have it in for us. Another torpedo barely missed our stern as we turned on hard right rudder. The attack was short but furious. 
Things looked bleak for the small American force in Lake Tikal. Just 11 miles away was a Japanese airfield with an estimated 150 planes. In the nearby islands, our reconnaissance flyers counted 52 enemy airfields. Was the worst yet to come? Despite the danger, the tankers performed their fueling operations throughout the day with success. Again, by late afternoon, the ships were steaming in the usual zigzag motion beneath a heavy smoke screen. Again, the alarm. Bomb-laden enemy planes appeared. American guns put up a heavy cover of flak, which gave the sky a polka dot appearance. It was hot for the Japs up there, so hot that many carelessly dropped their bombs and left. A braver few ventured in. Two bombs came too close to an ammunition ship for comfort. A bomber roared in on the tanker group and was blasted to a million pieces. And again, all was silent. Next morning, a victorious American force returned. Some of the battleships, cruisers, and destroyers showed the effects of battle, but most were in good shape. They had met and defeated the Japanese fleet in the history-making second battle of the Philippines. The enemy had been practically annihilated. On the fourth morning, after another dusk and dawn attack, a boatload of Filipinos made their way to one of our ships. One of the groups, a woman speaking very good English, asked if she might come aboard. Her request was granted. She laid out a map before the commanding officer and pointed to a few positions. The men by this time were nearing the exhaustion point. Under continuous attack by planes, they had had little sleep and few minutes for chow. We had no air coverage whatsoever. Our planes were busy fighting a hard battle on the beach. Some were harassing residents of the Jap fleet. For a while, it seemed, that Uncle Sam had forgotten us. Valcor writes, at last, orders came for the tankers. A fueling date at sea was set. It was a happy crew that heard the hum of the engines as we headed down Sarago Strait. Before we left, the Japs came again. Over 100 planes were in the attack. 40 were shot down. Miraculously, there were no fires or casualties. Johnny says, my gun was facing the ocean floor. Specky turned to me and said, you got your wish, Johnny. You don't have to kill anyone. I said, yes, the only thing I'm going to kill is fish. Weem writes, on the next day, there were four attacks, 545, 605, 736, and 816. The following day brought four more at 827, 1818, 1838, and 1906. On the following morning, the tankers met another task force. It was just another day of fueling for the gray tanker. She was given orders and limped away with one DE escort. Her job was done for a while. Now she sits in the Navy Yard, unnoticed and quite modest beside the gray cruiser. On October 27th, after another attack, we left Leyte Golf and returned to San Pedro for repairs. And when we returned to New Guinea, we had a 34 by 24 foot hole in our side. The next set of slides are from the National Archives. They are the action reports during the Battle of Leyte Golf. I am going to start with three apologies. The poor quality of the documents, there are only three out of the five pages, and for mispronouncing the names of the ships. Action Report of USS Astubula, October 23rd, 24th, 25th, 26th, and 27th, 1944. This action report covers the period during which the USS Astubula was in Leyte Gulf, Philippine Islands, as part of Task Unit 77.7.1. It was the function of this task unit to provide fuel and ammunition to units of the 7th Fleet covering landing operations on Leyte Island. Commander of Task Unit was Captain J.D. Beard, USN, aboard the USS Astabula. 
The remainder of the task unit was composed of USS Salamine, USS Saranac, USS Chipachi, USS Mazama, SS Durham Victory. The escorts were USS Bowers, USS Whitehurst, USS Whittier, USS Wilmarth, and USS Manning. The unit was later joined by USS Samiko and USS Kishwaki with escort USS Lovelace. During the period covered, Japanese air raids were frequent over the area. The raids consisted chiefly of small nuance raids from four to eight planes, which slowed up fueling operations of the unit considerably. The task unit was originally scheduled to remain in fueling area about 90 miles to the east of Leitiga. However, in obedience to dispatch from CTF-77 on October 21st, proceeded into the Gulf arriving in Cerigo Straits at 717 October 23rd, 1944. After entering the Straits, the task unit formed a column and proceeded up sweep channel at 17 knots to Anchorage area, latitude 11 degrees north, about seven miles east of beachhead of Leyte Island. At 10.31, the USS Astubula anchored in assigned Anchorage area. During the remainder of the morning and afternoon, units of TG 77.2 came alongside to receive fuel. At 17.02, in obedience to orders of CTU 77.7.1, the tanker unit got underway for safer anchorage southwest of Homan Hun Island on the eastern side of Lake Tegoth. Air raid condition red was set at 1815 and for four enemy planes were sighted over transport areas. However, none made an approach towards the convoy. At 1911, USS Astubula secured from general quarters and set condition IIMA, manning all 40 millimeter guns. The convoy anchored one and one fourth miles southwest of Hanuman Island at 2105. A radar guard was maintained by the screening ships. The remainder of the evening was uneventful. Then we're missing page two. Page three. Guns opened fire on planes remaining within range. Expending five rounds, 30 inch slash 50, 70 rounds, 40, can't read what that says, 180 rounds, 20 millimeter, HET, and 360 rounds, 20 mm, HEI, no casualties. At 1850, engine and fire room reported no damage. The communication officer reported SA radar and TBS out of order and set up TBY on bridge temporarily. By 1900, the ship had developed a 13 and a half list to port. The first lieutenant had reported damage sustained and had begun pumping cargo overboard from number four, five, and eight port wing, tanks and filling, number six starboard wing tank with water by gravitation in order to right ship. At 1910, speed was set at 10 knots and the ship proceeded away from shore. Escorted by USS Bowers, the USS Salamine had assumed tactical command of task unit by 1905 and proceeded southward at best speed. At 2002, ship was righted and by 2020, both TBS and SA radar were again functioning properly. At 2035, USS Astubula and USS Bowers rejoined the task unit, and CTU 77.7.1 took tactical command. The remainder of the night was spent steaming on evasive course near the center of Leyte Gulf. October 25, 1944. Continued steaming on evasive course near center of Leyte Gulf. Crews still had general quarter stations were given alert at 0450 in anticipation of dawn attacks. At 5.45, three planes flew near convoy, but were driven off by gunfire. 
At 6.05, a plane approached port bow, turned and was shot down as it pulled away. By this time, convoy was making funnel smoke and was making emergency 45 degree turns. At 6.47, 7.36, 8.15, planes approached convoy, but not within range of USS Astabula. At 8.47, one plane crossed bow and was fired upon. Amount of ammunition expended, nine rounds, 35 rounds, 386 rounds, 772 rounds, and no casualties. Evasive courses were continued until 10.15, at which time task unit was ordered to previous night's anchorage south of Sarmar Island by OTC to commence fueling operations with TF-77, anchored at 11.35 and secured from general quarters at 11.45. At 12.44, alert was sounded. Enemy planes in the area sounded general quarters. Action report, page five. The unit from attacking planes, though it did not, did on the other hand decrease the accuracy of fire control. For this reason, it is doubtful whether it is of direct advantage for moving ships. Navigation in Leyte Gulf was simplified by HO charts that proved to be accurate. At night, all navigation was done by radar, radar and reasonably accurate. Bearings and distances were obtained from SL equipment aboard. The officers and men are to be commended on the manner displayed in the execution of their assigned battle duties. Lieutenant Lewis V. Peterson, DMUSNR, and Lieutenant J.G. Edward F. Weeks demonstrated outstanding qualities of their respective duties and are to be especially commended for their prompt and efficient accent, action in maintaining full power and counteracting the list immediately after the torpedo struck. The following documents appear to be carbon copies of the original correspondence to the USS Astabula. The documents were falling apart due to age when I found them. After talking with personnel at the National Archive, it appears after the war they did not keep memos. As soon as I realized how rare these documents might be, I put them in plastic. This document states that the USS Astrobulo was part of Halsey's Third Fleet. I will read the document. Powerful forces of the U.S. Pacific Fleet have been assembled on waters off the coast of Japan for operations in connection with the forthcoming occupation of Japan. The naval forces scheduled to enter Japan, Japanese waters in the first stages of the naval occupation of the Tokyo area of the enemy home islands are under the operational control of Admiral William F. Halsey, USN Commander, USN Third Fleet, in his flagship, the USS Missouri. These forces and those in immediate support include the following ships. On the next page, you'll see the Astabula. You can see that the Astrobula is listed. Thank you. Our fourth and last trip of the war began January 28, 1945 at midnight. After stopping at Pearl Harbor again, we proceeded to Nwentok and to Ulithi. We were watching a movie on the cargo deck there one night when two Jap suicide planes came over and hit the large carrier Randolph off our port beam. Lilithi was our base for the rest of the war. We were serving the fifth fleet on that Easter Sunday morning when the Marines hit the beach of Okinawa. After the Okinawa invasion, we were with Halsey, Admiral Halsey, known as the Bull, a third fleet in the final carrier attacks and bombardment of the Jap homeland in June, July, and August. This painting of the USS Astabula hung in my father's barbershop for many years. Back to the blue book, log book. 
No, the Ashtabula did not get her picture in the paper with the Franklin, Bunker Hill, South Dakota, Porter, and Missouri. Her activities were not so spectacular. But without the Ashtabula and her sister fleet tankers, the Navy could not have carried on the long-range war necessary to defeat Japan. Admiral Halsey, who should know, told us that one afternoon after the last big fueling rendezvous of the war with the mighty Third Fleet. Log, June 2nd. This is a sample of punishment. If you look into the fourth paragraph, it says smoking while smoking lamp was out and the punishment was 40 hours extra duty and someone must have been smoking with him because it says same as above. And another one was forging an officer's name to a property pass. And the punishment is debt court, so evidently they are going to deal with him later. From the Blue Log Book. The boys say that liberty in Pedro was unusually good in December and January of 1944-45. Three liberty parties left the ship every night. The first left over the forward legal gangway where the OOD officer of the deck was. The second over the after gangway where a Mary sentry was stationed and third through the torpedo hole in the side of the ship. Some also may have put on dungarees over their dress Liberty Blues and requested permission from the OOD to go on the dock to make a phone call, in quotes. Deck Law, January 1st, 1945. I found this deck log to be the most Surprising to find John R. Condash, AOL, since 0800, December 31st, 1944. The ship had docked in California for repairs. I guess everyone had a good time. New Year's Eve, 1944. Sample deck log from March 7th, 1945. March 7, 1945, message. Through Commodore Quinn, Deputy Commander and Chief of Staff, I express to you my deep gratitude and send to you my profound thanks. Well done. After 63 months in command of the base force and service force, I know and appreciate who has done the magnificent job for which Conserve PAC has received the credit. It is the splendid officers and men of the service force. As your commander throughout five years, I send you my love, my aloha, and deep appreciation. May we meet again. Good luck and God bless you all. Signed, Uncle Bill, W.A. Garrison, Lieutenant J.G. U.S.N.R., Commander, Watch Officer. third paragraph showing punishment on board. Insolence and threatening a petty officer, plea guilty, sentence, five days solitary confinement on bread and water with full ration every third day. Deck log, June 4th, 1945. If you look at the third paragraph, it says inspection of magazines and smokeless powder samples condition abnormal and then the next paragraph you see crew at fire drill deck log june 26 1944 i copied this one for the first paragraph it says ship in material condition quote baker condition of readiness iims guns one two four and five manned I asked many current Navy personnel what Baker condition meant. No one knew what it was. I got answers like it must be a World War II term because they don't use it anymore. One individual said it is used on submarines for state of readiness. Deck log, June 7th, 1945. 
This is a map showing where USS Ashtabula was located on August 15, 1945, when the bomb was dropped in Hiroshima or Hiroshima. Plan of the day, Tuesday, July 24, 1945. 0400, call Cooks. 0600, call MAA. 0630, Reveille. 0650, breakfast. 0800, report 8 o'clock to the commanding officer. Muster all stations, turn to. 0830, 6 call. 0900, head of departments and division officers inspect their sections of the ship and report to the executive officer. 1030, section 2 condition watch of gun number 3, 4, MM, lay aft to the loading machine for loading drill. 1115, knock off, pipe down sweepers. 1130, dinner. 1200, report 12 o'clock and chronometers wound to the commanding officer. 1300, emergency drill, turn two. 1515, knock off, pipe down sweep. 1630, supper. Sunset, darken ship. 1930, heads of departments make security reports to the executive officer. 2000, report eight o'clock to the commanding officer. Notice, CTF 38, Admiral Halsey, sent the following message to TG30.8 yesterday. Well done to all hands in TG30.8 for tossing more beans, bullets, and bug juice than has ever been done before during a similar period. Your untiring efforts have only been equaled by those in TF38 who received with enthusiasm all you could pitch. This big blue team could not possibly continue without well-planned and sturdy support. Your boys have a direct hand in every bomb and bullet that is thrown at the nips. Signed, Halsey. CTG 30.8 sent. If hard work, sweat, and cheerful effort will held win the war, the TG 30.8 has done its full share. Good work, and may we all be home for Christmas. Signed, P.M. Dale, Jr., Lieutenant, USNR, Executive Officer. Plan of the Day, August 7, 1945, 03-10, call MAA, 03-15, Reveille, 03-20, morning coffee to be prepared for all hands. 0330, all hands man their fueling stations. 0600, breakfast. 0800, report 8 o'clock to the commanding officer. 0830, 6 call. 1130, dinner. 1200, report 12 o'clock and chronometers wound to the commanding officer. 1630, supper. Sunset, darkened ship. 1930, Heads of departments make security reports to the executive officer. 2000, report 8 o'clock to the commanding officer. Notice, today is the mighty A's birthday. Your ship is two years old. Many of us remember very well August 7, 1943, the day Astrobula joined in this fight against the aggressor nations. Opportunity does not permit our observing our celebration as had been planned. However, we will do our best with what we have. Many of you would like to know that your ship has st streamed 115,336 miles during this time and fueled 323 ships, delivering 813,316 barrels of fuel oil and 1,503,280 gallons of AV gas. Credit has been given us for jobs well done. This only could have been accomplished through your untiring efforts during our fueling operation. Astabula has also played her part in the action against the enemy when she suffered battle damage sustained in the Battle of Leyte Gulf on October 24, 1944. The damage to her ship crippled us, 
but we were sturdily stuck and fought it out with all hands coming th through safely. The captain is most proud of his ship and crew, and I feel certain that I speak for each and every one that it has been our pleasure to serve under him. We've come a long way together. The road home doesn't look too far away. P.M. Dale Jr. August 15, 1945. All hands of the United States Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard may take satisfaction in the conclusion of the war against Japan and pride in the part played by them in accomplishing that result. The demobilization of the armed forces of the United States and the return to conditions of peace will create problems taxing patience and control almost as great as the tension of war. I ask that the discipline, which has served so well to bring this democracy through hours of great crisis, be maintained to the end, that nothing shall mar the record of accomplishment and glory that now belongs to the Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard. James Forstall, GCT 2342. This is a sample of the deck log. I just put it in because the note of movie night. If you notice the reference to the Tojo monkey in the Astrobula song, Unfortunately, this phrase was common during World War II. The USS Astabula did write a new song after World War II. I apologize if anyone takes offense to it now. When the war is over and the last battles won, the first ship to leave its mark will be the AO-51. When the crews disband and we are home to stay, we'll still have fond memories of the mighty, mighty A. There is a story about a monkey named Tojo that was on a U.S. Air Force plane that made an emergency landing during the war in 1943 in Klokali, West Cork. Um, it's C-L-O-N-A-K-I-L-L-Y, West Cork. I'm attaching the link if you are interested in that story. Someone brought a monkey on the ship. Everyone had fun with him, and after Leite Golf, we were all ready to have fun. He was a friend to everyone. I loved animals, and I would give some of my dinner and bananas whenever I could. The captain didn't know about the monkey. We hid it the best we could. But one day, the captain spotted the monkey and said, Johnny, get this monkey off the ship. I protested. It's not my monkey. I don't care if it's not your monkey. Get it off the ship. Get two of your friends and figure out how to get it off the ship. I understood that monkeys carry diseases and I knew the captain was right. So I got two of my buddies and got a laundry bag, filled it with weights and lured the monkey in the bag with bananas. After that, they had to throw him overboard. I was heartbroken. The monkey didn't do anything wrong. It was our fault for bringing him on the ship. I had nightmares about the monkey and the look on his face when we tricked him into the bag. Monkeys look so much like humans when you look into their eyes. And that is why this slide is dedicated in the memory of the monkey on board the USS Astubula. To lighten it up, here I am with the dog named Ashta and we had a cat named Beulah. My friends, Manly, and thus were transferred on November 30th, 1945, when we were anchored in Yokohama, Japan. It was sad to see them go. U.S. NTC Bainbridge, named for Commodore William Bainbridge, who served in the Barbary Wars and the War of 1812. The U.S. Naval Training Center Bainbridge operated for 34 years, beginning in 1942 as a recruit training command for World War II and closing in 1976. The complex was a mustering out facility and provided naval reserve. Women accepted for volunteer emergency service waves and other specialized training. The U.S. Naval Academy Preparatory School was housed in the former Tome Schools for Boys. 
I left the USS Astribula and was transferred to USS Effingham on 2-5-1946 to go to the separation center. I arrived in Bainbridge, Maryland, 3-5-1946 and discharged from the Navy on 3-8-1946. The Bollard still remains at Bainbridge, Maryland. Dedicated to the men of Bainbridge Naval Training Center who learned their seamanship upon the waters of the Susquehanna, partners in the victory of World War II. My buddies and I went skating in Philadelphia. It was great. The moment I stepped into the roller rink, I felt at home, and there, skating up a storm, was a beautiful girl with long black hair and a beautiful smile. She was talking with another girl when she noticed I was staring at her. Rita said to her sister Mary, that guy is looking at you. Maybe he will ask you to skate with him. Mary said, I'm not skating with any sailor. They don't know how to skate. Then they pull you down when they fall. No, thank you. Oh no, here he comes. Rita said, go ahead, Mary, give him a chance. Mary said, oh, okay. Rita watched as they glided over the skating rink. He did know how to roller skate and Mary was smiling from ear to ear. His name was John Arkundash and he came down to Philadelphia every weekend to skate with Mary. I swept her away to Bethlehem, PA. We were married August 17th, 1946. Her sister reader recalled the day they were married. The reception was small, but nice. Her maid of honor, Carly and I stayed overnight at the house. Mary and John spent the wedding night there too. Carly and I and the best man and my usher went out for a while and got home late and they left the door unlocked for us. Carly and I got to giggling about the fact that they were in their room for their wedding night upstairs. We were trying to be quiet and were stumbling around in the dark in a strange place. And the more we tried to be quiet, the more we giggled. So as you might expect, we weren't as quiet as we thought. This is no great punchline or anything, but the next morning, Mary and John made a point of letting us know that they heard us. So as you can imagine, Curly and I were a little embarrassed as we knew they knew what we were giggling about. I wanted to end on a happy note of the Seaman First Class from the USS Astabula. Thank you. The end. This is a cartoon from the Blue Log Book. Thank you for listening. I would like to thank the crewmen of the USS Astabula, the crew members that contributed stories to the USS Astabula two-year anniversary log book, Paul McGinty, Christopher Gibbons, Chris James, John Sefko, Eric Schubert, 2018 USS Astrobula Reunion, Robert Pandeleon, and the Kundash family. This is a picture of men that were on the USS Astrobula during World War II. It was taken at a reunion in Evansville, Indiana uh, in 2011. I do not have their names, sorry.